Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Philip on Lent 5. And also, I see a green shirt over there. <laughs> Any other green shirts here today? T-shirt. I know sometimes people bring coffee into the service, but nobody dared bring in Guinness, right? <laughs> Happy St. Patty's Day, everyone. If you're a guest here today, welcome. Uh, trust that you'll find this service to be encouraging and strengthening to your faith. Uh, we all need our faith strengthened in this world as we make our journey through it. And we remind ourselves of that in Lent for sure. Um, if you are a guest, please do introduce yourself to one of the wonderful congregants here. We have coffee after the service, coffee and tea. I know, we're really splurging. <laughs> That'll be downstairs. And of course, with this weather, you can wander about the, the premises. I'm sure the outside will be open. If you're joining us on live stream today, welcome as well. We trust that uh, you are joining us in spirit, uh, if not in body. We recognize that the place in which we worship today has been uh, lived on and lived into for millennia by the uh, Lekwungen Athun speaking peoples. And we stand and sit and worship and work on traditional, their traditional and unceded territories. Along with our Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation sisters and brothers, we are pledging ourselves to walk a path of reconciliation um, and we will see what that means for us in the years going forward. Yes, I am on. Let us hold this moment open to the Spirit of God. Blessed are you, Lord God, our Maker and Redeemer. This is your world, and we are your people. Come among us and save us. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the Trisagion through three times. through Jesus Christ calls us into your covenant of love. Enable us now to reflect your love 
so that barriers erected by sin may be broken down and all people may be drawn to you. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated to listen for the word of God. Invite the children to come forward with Shannon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tyrosin. Thank you. 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 Th
the children to go with Shannon and the youth to go with Gavin. <coughs> Please stand for the gradual sin song. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say, Father? Save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. 
now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, I was in that stage of REM sleep where the, the need to use the bathroom, the need to keep sleeping, and my conscious mind were jostling for control. Now, I probably, like you, if, if you reach that point in your night's journey, you probably can have some strange dreams at that point, and I've had many a doozy that I make my, that I regale my wife with over <laughs> breakfast. Some real doozies that make my children go, Dad, what is going on in there? But this one wasn't one of those. It, it felt more like, like a visitation, to be honest with you. I, I dreamt about death, and I, I rarely do, and, and I was anxious about it in my dream. And I don't, I can't ever remember praying in my dream, but I prayed, Lord, let me be ready. And then, still in this dream, a voice said, you will have just the grace you need at that moment. And I felt the anxiety slip away. And then the, the scene shifted to a formative time in my life when as a young adult, I was falling in love and exploring ideas in the world, coming alive spiritually. And, and the color palette, as those of you have uh, no, uh, can change dramatically in a dream. And mine went from these muted tones to vibrant colors. Fascinatingly, people who I knew from different times in my ministry, different parishes, uh, who I knew had experienced a great amount of grief and trauma in their lives, were present and were whole. You know, it's like that scene at the end of the Return of the Jedi, right? When all the people who have died are shimmering, standing there. It was like we had all gone on this journey together, taken life's blows, and now we were back at the beginning of our adult journeys with all that we had experienced as older adults still in place, but now reconciled to it and reconciled to each other. And, and at that moment, I woke as deeply moved by a dream as I ever have been. And I think that's because sometimes our dreams resonate with our journey more than our waking thoughts. And I look at Jesus' counterintuitive language in John 12 in much the same way. It resonates, I think, more at an unconscious level than at a conscious one. Maybe subconscious is the better word. It starts innocently enough, doesn't it? A group of Greeks come to Philip and say, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Presumably, they are non-Jewish converts in town for the great feast. And they've heard of this upstart rabbi who's the talk of the tabloids, and they're wondering if he's got time for coffee. Okay, that's a bit silly, I know, but in John's chronology, what we read today happens just after Jesus' triumphal entry into the city, something we'll observe on Palm Sunday next week. It made me think that sometimes the lectionary itself practices dreamlike confusion or time confusion. 
So presumably they've seen this event unfold. So these Greeks are not just wanting to take a selfie with Jesus, but they're, they're after genuine knowledge. More to the point, they're probably wanting to understand who Jesus is for them, is to them. I mean, put that way, isn't that our question as well? Who are you to us? Occasionally, I'll be chatting with somebody about religion or Christ, for that matter, and I'll hear words I used to say as an earnest young man. I don't want to hear about any doctrine or religion. Stop all the fancy talk and just explain Jesus to me. And I get it. At that point, it doesn't really help for me to indulge in some sophistic sophisticated argument about hermeneutical interpretation. Sir, I wish to see Jesus is entirely appropriate. But of course, Jesus is well aware that the more important the question, the more fraught the answer. The more implicated we are in constructing the answer. And so Jesus is fully aware that it's not information we need. To get back to the roots of, of modern psychology, something quite well known to the ancients, but in different terms, surface knowledge merely reinforces what we think we already know. In other words, surface knowledge is self-serving. Spiritual insight comes when we're able to get under the hood, under the surface. So a nice compliment to um, surface knowledge is self-serving might be something like the unconscious uncovers. To get under the surface requires a looking away from what makes initial sense. Thus dreams, thus poetry, music, thus paradox. And as a spiritual master, Jesus practices this kind of misdirection throughout his teaching, almost never answering a question without telling some kind of story, trading in some kind of epigram or cryptic saying, and in this case, engaging in language that is more, that I think, more easily interacts with our dreams than it does with our rational minds. Rather than using words of Welcome, words of inclusion. Isn't it wonderful? Even the Greeks are getting on board. He offers instead the Gospel of John's most concentrated group of sayings about his death. Instead of meeting them where they're at, being contextually sensitive, he offers us a kind of art installation of words that provokes us, that makes us grapple with feelings and motivations. We focus on health, on beauty, on strength. It's totally normal to do so, right to do so. But if we do that in order to deny death, we trick ourselves and we begin to hold on to objectify those things, to make idols of them. And this, Jesus knows, is the danger that is afoot concerning his own identity. People have just worshipped him upon his entry into Jerusalem. They identify him with strength, security, health and prosperity. But Jesus knows that this kind of surface knowledge is self-serving. That people are simply projecting onto him an invented God of their own making. A God who will be discarded in a heartbeat when disappointment comes. When God fails to deliver the health, the power, the strength the people want, that you and I want. So Jesus is those who love their life lose it. 
Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life is the wake-up call they and we all need. It's not self-hatred, of course. We have here classic Jesus hyperbole. Of course it's not. It's, not, it's never self-hatred with Jesus. We're created in the image of God and carry the image of God. Each of us is a beloved daughter, son, person. But precisely because we are, Christ leads us to confront the patterns of imitation that are mere surface knowledge by which we judge others, by which we judge ourselves. And this, this pattern that Christ confronts is so natural to us that it feels like a comfortable pair of slippers. Even to start giving it up feels like giving up an addiction. Feels like dying, actually. In my dream, a voice assured me that the grace would be sufficient to help me die. And upon reflection on the dream afterwards, I realized it wasn't just about dying then. It was about dying now. And in this text, a voice from heaven sets the stage for good news. People recognize some disturbance. You know, it, it seems to indicate an, an actual physical noise, but I imagine there was a lot of psychic disturbance as Jesus was saying these things. They can't make out what the message really is. So attuned are we to surface talk of things that please us. And Jesus too, of course, is is deeply disturbed. He's, he's troubled in his soul, the text says. And then he says these, I think, very powerfully hopeful words. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be driven out. It will happen somehow as Jesus is lifted up. But I'm, I'm struck by the word now, now, it's happening. All that is ultimately damaging is beginning to be exposed and undone by this dying, by Jesus' own and by our dying to our idols. A few months ago, around Christmas time, Mike Pipes gave me this piece of wood, this cross. A piece of driftwood, right, Mike? Did you find it on the beach? I never asked you. Uh, desolation Sound. Desolation Sound. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Discovered it on one of his walks. Um, I told him I'd wear it as we approached this the greatest mystery of our faith. This beautiful, asymmetrical, spiraled snag came this way through violence. DNA analysis would identify the type of tree. It might be too young to date, effectively, however, but however old it is, it came to this shape not just from that initial breaking, that hiss of ripping carbon fibers, tearing. But, yes, through that, but also its long journey through water, smashing up against rocks, freezing, baking in turn, and maybe it was a very different shape at one point, but a family was walking and a child picked it up. And before the father could say anything, she threw it and it splintered against the rocks, forming this unlikely cruciform jewel. 
And even as it rests on my chest, it is part of the great spiral of life and death. It is made of much the same stuff as my body is made out of, as your body is made out of. We wear these crosses because at one extraordinary moment, God's Christ rested on the chest of one of these. The fabric of the universe tore, and much that needed to be uncovered began to be seen. But we wear them not because of, just because it's about a past event. We wear them because Christ's cross isn't just an historical artifact, but active. Its shaping journey runs through our hearts. And so now deep into Lent, I pray that Christ's voice becomes the great uncoverer in us, that we experience by whatever means, dreams, conversations, encounters of various kinds, the grace inherent in this symbol, the grace that we need for the journey ahead of us. Amen. As you're able, please stand with me. During Lent, we've been using this affirmation of faith uh, provided by the Aona community just off the coast of Scotland. And uh, they're known, of course, for their social justice work, their songwriting within the Presbyterian Church, the Church of Scotland, and around the world. Let us affirm our faith in God who believe in God, who made the sun and the sky, the stars and the sea, who calls us to live responsibly. We believe in Jesus Christ, who became human, who healed the sick, who talked to children, who made friends with sinners. He burned brightly and offended many. His journey was one of life and death and resurrection. His light continues to shine in darkness. We believe in the Holy Spirit who inspires the scriptures and whose breath we breathe. We believe that God calls us to be a community committed to one another, offering a welcome to everyone, old and young, rich and poor, strong and weak. We believe that God calls us to be peacemakers, workers for justice, brothers and sisters, a light for our world. Amen. Please take a position of prayer suitable for you. God, we come before you in humility and gratitude for the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus who in love was obedient to his calling, opening the way for us and all humanity to be reconciled to you. As we continue our Lenten journey, 
May your Holy Spirit transform us to reflect your glory in our lives. We pray together saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our We lift up to you our world. We long for the fulfillment of your vision of a world free of war, hatred, greed, and want. Raise up leaders who have a heart after your heart, who will break down the economic, political, and social barriers that divide us and govern with justice and compassion. Comfort all those in precarious circumstances due to famine, terrorism, and other forms of oppression and war. In a moment of silence, we pray for the people of Haiti, Gaza, and Ukraine, for a willingness of leaders to lay down weapons, for a blueprint for peace and security, and food and medical care for all those who are at risk of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our community. Your creation is abundant and sufficient for all, yet we see inequality around us. Jesus asks us, who is your neighbor? We pray that we, no matter of our circumstances, not to be so taken up with our own concerns that we do not respond to the needs and sufferings of others in our city, on our streets, and in our neighborhoods. Help us to follow in the path of obedience as Jesus did, giving of ourselves, our gifts, and our resources in service to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, that through your spirit it might speak into the needs of all humanity with truth and love. We pray for wisdom for Anna, our bishop. We give thanks for Alan and the gifts of ministry that he has brought into our community in the past year. Continue to guide him and the parish council as they seek to discern your vision for our future. In our diocesan cycle of prayer this week, we pray for the people of the parish of St. Andrew Sydney and their clergy, Kelly Duncan and Julie Mallet. As part of the Anglican Church of Canada, we pray for the Right Reverend Mary Irwin Gibson Bishop and the people and clergy of the Diocese of Montreal, that it might be a voice for tolerance and inclusion. Together with our full community partners in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, we pray for the elimination of racial discrimination. We ask that you provide for the spiritual and material needs of the congregation of Maralai's church in Rabbi Syria and the priest, Father Sam Neen. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love and mercy, we intercede for those of our community who are in need of your healing presence in their lives. Bring comfort to those who are ill or in pain. Give peace to all unquiet minds and troubled spirits. Strengthen and comfort their families. Karen Norman, Helen Suotis, Becky Tuffin, Molly Wontong, Robert Holloway, Alan, and others who remember in the quietness of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of suffering and glory, in Jesus Christ, you reveal the way of life through obedience to you. Help us to walk in the way of your truth, that our lives might glorify you. Amen. We continue with our prayers and the confession we're using during Lent. 
Let us remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. We acknowledge the dust and ash in our lives. We commit ourselves to new growth, saying, Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you're able, please stand with me. Sisters and brothers, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. With you, Chen. Jesus say. Accept the praise and thanksgiving we offer you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Praise God.
God is with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to Lord to the Lord our God. He is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth, because you bid your faithful people to cleanse their hearts and to prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that reborn through the waters of baptism and renewed in the Eucharistic mystery, we may be more fervent in prayer and more generous in the works of love. Therefore, we raise our voices to you in praise to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God and above all in the Word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, a death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we, made acceptable in him, may be sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, reconcile all things in Christ and make them new. And bring us to that city of light where you dwell with all your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. 
by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior has taught us, we pray.
Merciful God, you have called us to your table and fed us with the bread of life. Draw us and all people to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements.
morning. It's true, the world turns faster and we're at Easter again. So I'll be at the back collecting money for the flowers for Easter. Thank you. I'd just like to remind you to sign up for the Agape Meal, which is on Thursday, March 28th. We want everybody who wishes to participate to be able to come. That's why we're doing two sittings. One is at five and one is at seven. It's a very simple meal with um, bread, soup, wine, um, and it's got uh, readings and prayers along with it. So it's a very meaningful time. It's very successful last year, very well received. This year we're innovating a little bit. Last year you all had to bring your own bowls. This year we're actually providing bowls, which is really helpful when you're serving soup. So please come, please sign up. So I'm still enjoying playing around with all the butterflies that people are creating. Shannon just passed me this one, that I think is one of the recent ones just done. Beautiful. We have, and I've put together a little bouquet of a few that I've put on their wires. There's a lot of them, but we would really like people who are thinking, well, maybe not, maybe I won't. We would love it if you could get around to it and produce a whole lot more. We will use any we are given. And it's kind of fun on when we're decorating for Easter to find these places we can put these new things. So they're available at the back. Um, there's a box there that talks about this whole project. And there's some downstairs. So please take them away, do them here. We need them back by next week on Sunday. So that's what the current thing that we're doing is. Thank you. Good morning. morning. I am half Irish. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, by coincidence, I bought this sweater this year, so woo! Yeah. Um, so this is a, a personal um, announcement. Uh, in April, Eric and I are going to see our son in California from the 6th to the 13th. And I've had two sets of people lined up to take care of our 15 and a half year old Shih Tzus. Shih Tzus, sorry. Anyway, um, one of them got a job and uh, is gonna be out in the peninsula, so says they're not now not available. And the other party says they're now going to Australia. So if any of you know anyone who would like to stay in Oak Bay at our home, um, they walk maybe one block, maybe two, um, twice a day, out for a pee once, you can go out for six or seven hours, there's a spare bedroom all ready for you, or if it's better for you to have them at your home, it does of course come with payment. Um, if you know of anybody who would be available to do this from the 6th to the 13th, thank you. Just thought I'd throw thank it you. out there, okay. Hi everyone. I'm Jackie, I'm part of the St. Philip Mission Committee, and I think Judith gave you a little bit of an update last week, but we've heard from Gladys, who's the director of the uh, Foundation for the Children of Haiti. So I just wanted to uh, read you her brief message that she sent out yesterday. My dear friends, with the recent news of chaos in Haiti, I thought it would be good to provide you with an update. The current situation is worse, is wor the worst I have ever seen in Haiti. For the past few weeks, the criminal gangs have been terrorizing Port-au-Prince for the past three years and have started to work together to consolidate their power. Groups of heavily armed gangs, better armed than the patient police, have taken over Port-au-Prince. The gangs are burning police stations and other public facilities. A couple of weeks ago, gangs attacked Haiti's main container port and the international airport, which remains closed. They then broke into two prisons, allowing over 4,000 prisoners to escape putting many very dangerous criminals on the street. The vulnerable population is running in all directions seek, seeking safety, but nowhere is safe. With the resignation of the Prime Minister earlier this week, the gangs now want to take control of the government. This is worse than anything we have previously faced or feared. Thankfully, despite the chaos, the children and staff of um, Foundation of Children of Haiti are still safe, 
through God's grace, the area of Dalmas, where the hospital and villages are located, has remained mostly calm, despite some random shootings. The staff at the Children's Village are doing what they can to make the life as normal as possible for the children at Rainbow of Love and the residents of Hope Home. Many teachers are making it to the Children's Village School, so classes continue, although the neighborhood children who attended the school are not coming due to the dangers in leaving their homes. Hope Hospital staff are working hard in keeping the hospital open. SeaTech and the Masat School are located in, the southern, in southern Haiti, where the situation is safer. The students are doing well and the classes have not been interrupted. We're keeping our eyes on the food shortage, trying to buy as much as we can when we find it. The current challenges in Haiti seem insurmountable, but we are not losing hope. We are taking life one hour at a time. I'm sorry. We know God is in control. Thank you for your prayers. Please pray for us and for our strength. So Gladys asks that we pray for her and the children. Um, they're trying to raise more money so when food becomes available, they can buy it. And um, they're also encouraging people to send a brief message of support to Gladys. So if you're not on the um, mail and you'd like to be, please talk to Judith and myself and we can have you signed up. And we'd like to ask for your prayers. Thanks, Today is an auspicious day. It is partly because it's St. Patrick's Day. And like, um, like Dana, I'm half Irish, and it's obviously the top half. Uh, the, the other reason for it being an auspicious day is today we mark the anniversary of Alan Alan uh, Dirksen's first Sunday ministering to us here at St. Philip. And so we have a bit of a special day planned for us. Um, we would encourage you to make your way down and have to the basement where we will have coffee and tea for you. We have a cake and we have fruit down there for some celebration. We have told Alan that we are not going to make him make a speech. Um, although we couldn't stop him if he wanted to. Um, and <laughs> as you make your way down the stairs, there are supposed to be five poster boards with, which, which kind of uh, in photographic terms document, the, uh, document Alan's first year here with us. Um, so have a pause and have a look at some of those photos. You may see yourself in them. And um, by all means, come downstairs, celebrate with Alan, um, and enjoy the time together uh, in fellowship uh, celebrating this first year. Thank you. I did see a bouncy castle as well down there, but I think maybe it got... I, th I think I'm too heavy for that. <laughs> this, is, this is surprising. I don't know, what are you guys doing? <laughs> oh, could we pay for you? Absolutely, yeah, thank you. Creator God, we thank you for Alan's presence here among us for the year that we've had as we have learned to love him and to uh, experience his gifts of teaching and pastoral care and his ability to be vulnerable among us. And we thank you for this congregation that has been so welcoming to him. We ask that you will guide us as we look to our future and look to learn to love you and serve you better. Amen. Amen. Oh, oh, Amen. Thank you so much. Well, this is very surprising to me, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to celebrate you. Uh, you have uh, really made my year a wonderful time, and uh, I'm really looking forward to what's next. So, um, before we sing our final song, I, I do have a blessing in the bulletin, but I thought we have to end with the... Oh, we, we're skipping something. Birthdays. birthdays, right. Before we do the Irish blessing, we have birthdays to celebrate. Uh, anybody have a birthday? Come on up. Come on up. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Wonderful. <laughs> so, I want to ask you your age, but when's the birthday? When's the birthday? The 20th. Okay, well... Happy birthday. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there you go. Let's pray. And, and do you go by Joy or Joyanne? Yeah, Joy, right. Thank you, Lord, for Joy. Thank you for her uh, 
um, joining us. Thank you for that she heard close to come among us and uh, thank you for their presence and thank you for Joy's life. Pray that you would bless her. Thank you for keeping her in these years through the, the difficulties and the joys of her journey. Thank you, Lord, that you have promised to be with us and will never leave us or forsake us. Ask that you would unfold and uncover beautiful things in Joy's life in this next year. Amen. Yeah, you bet. You got the Twizzlers. All right. Well, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Our final song. I'll ask the children to join me at the back. <laughs> 